Stanford University. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm John Echemendi, as the voice said, and I am Stanford's provost. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here, both those of you who are in CEMEX Auditorium and those of you who are watching remotely. This is a symposium, Thinking Big About Learning. I understand that uh, Bay Area teachers constitute more than half of this audience, and I want to personally thank you particularly for joining us today. And I want to thank you for all the good work that you do every day of the week. There's no more important obligation than educating the next generation. That's why we chose this vital subject to launch our celebration of Stanford's 125th anniversary. We hope that you will join us for other symposia that we'll be holding through the coming year. As most of you know, the university was founded by Jane and Leland Stanford after their only child, Leland, died, they promised to make the, the children of California their children. That vow, articulated in their founding grant, continues to inform Stanford's highest aspirations today. With that in mind, we've asked a number of experts in the field of education to share their perspectives today in the hopes that our community will be inspired by the hope and promise of learning. So please join me in welcoming our first set of speakers. They are John Mitchell, Stanford's Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, Daniel Schwartz, our newly appointed Dean of the Graduate School of Education, and Carolyn Winterer, the Director of the Stanford Humanities Center, one of the largest humanities centers in the world. So I'm going to join you. And uh, let me start with John. So John Mitchell here. John has been a computer science professor for over 25 years at Stanford, and only the last three has he been uh, an, a university administrator, a hated university administrator, you know. Uh, and <laughs> worst things could happen. <laughs> the worst right? things could happen. And John accepted uh, the role of vice provost for teaching and learning, which John Hennessy and I created three years ago, uh, to respond to the heightened interest in innovations in teaching and learning on campus. So, John, why don't you start by telling us what you've learned in the last three years? Well, there's a very complicated time for education. Uh, if you listen to the, uh, read the newspaper or listen to what's in the news, you'll hear about crisis and difficulty and so on. But I think it's also kind of a renaissance time for us in uh, learning and education. Uh, if you think back about history, the Renaissance wasn't just started by a bunch of Italians making a little more coffee and waking up one morning. Uh, there was a siege of Constantinople uh, that fell. Uh, lots of people with books in Greek uh, went to Italy where there were books in Latin and there was a lot of mixing. So there was a siege, a battle, panic, flight, and different groups of, of people getting together and comparing uh, their thoughts and cultures and, and working together. And I think we have something like that now uh, in education. There are computer scientists, learning scientists, uh, neuroscientists, virtual reality experts, uh, people in education, uh, all kind of working together and thinking about how we can uh, teach and, and learn better. Uh, the MOOCs hit here in 2012, and that was a very exciting time. Uh, many faculty here decided they could uh, communicate better, uh, provide better access to the things that they knew about, and uh, some of us started uh, startups here, which is another Stanford way of trying to get out uh, into the world. Uh, the group that I have worked with about 200 university instructors uh, on about 400 different projects that uh, affected over 100 different Stanford courses, and we released 50, 60 different distinct uh, free public massive open uh, online courses. So I think that demonstrates really our interest in uh, making the things that we know more broadly uh, accessible. Uh, I don't think the MOOCs are really going to change uh, college or replace college in the way that many people thought. 
but they got a lot of people here uh, interested in doing things differently, created a lot of energy, and I think if you look across campus, you see a lot of different faculty trying new things, some related to technology, some completely different, uh, separate from that, uh, but there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm, and that's why it's really, I think, a great time to be here, and a great time for all of you, I hope, uh, to be uh, down the street or, or in earshot or to interact with us in, in various ways. So are we going to be closing our doors anytime soon? Uh, I hope not. I don't think so. <laughs> University's been here for a long time, and uh, it's a great place to be. I think we'll be around for a while. So Carolyn, I'm going to jump to you now. So Carolyn is, uh, in, in addition to directing the Humanities Center, Carolyn is a historian, and she's a historian of ideas in higher education, so very appropriate. And I wonder if, from your kind of synoptic perspective, uh, whether you see any opportunities uh, for applying some of these innovations to teaching whole persons and future citizens? Yeah, well, that's a wonderful question, and it's such a great opportunity today to talk about these very important questions. Um, the university has so many functions in society, not just training future workers, but also training the whole person, the future citizens that are going to navigate an increasingly complicated world. And the training of whole persons, people able to answer questions like, who are we? Where are we going? Um, what is the good society? These are questions that the humanities uh, very much are involved with addressing. There's been an extraordinary revolution in the humanities in the last five years, which goes under the title Digital Humanities. But what that really means is that the whole corpus of the human experience, from Neolithic bones to Egyptian papyri to medieval manuscripts, to the thing you wrote down yesterday, this is all being loaded online. And what that means is that it is universally accessible. Uh, John invoked the Renaissance, so I'll keep going with that. This is a revolution akin to the invention of the printing press in the 15th century. It has democratized knowledge as almost nothing else has. Uh, but we've learned with that digital humanities revolution, the same lesson that we learned with the MOOCs is that it's not enough just to get your stuff out there. You still have to have the kinds of small, tactile, closely engaged teaching and learning experiences between teachers and students that help students to cultivate uh, the critical thinking skills that we need to create these whole persons and, and future citizens. So there's really a, a, a marrying of the old and the new with the humanities and digital technologies. And I'll just give you a quick example uh, of what's possible. Uh, I teach a class called the Age of Jefferson uh, for Stanford Summer Humanities Institute, which brings uh, 100 high school students to Stanford every summer for three weeks for a kind of boot camp or summer camp, depending on your perspective. Uh, at the end of this Age of Jefferson, we ask the students to tweet something uh, that Thomas Jefferson might have said. And their responses were extraordinary. In that small medium of the tweet, they were able to channel another time and another place. They were able to do what the humanities and the universities are so adept at doing, which is helping us to encounter other people, to broaden our humanity, and thereby to enter into the world as more complete citizens. So that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. So what were your, some of your favorite tweets? <laughs> Jeffersonian so, tweets. Yeah, Jeffersonian <laughs> tweets. So uh, my favorite tweet was, uh, every generation needs a new revolution. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, I, and it's so true. They, it's so 18th century. You know, talk about disruptive. This is the generation that brought us the French and American Revolution, but it's so true about yeah, today yeah. as well. But you know, if you had said, give me a, a Ben Franklin tweet, it would have been a lot easier. See, Franklin was kind of tweeting long yeah. before Twitter yeah. was even a twinkle in anybody's eye. Yeah, right? tweeting you know? avant so, la lettre. Yeah, Apple yeah. a day. And, so my favorite is, uh, what is it? Uh, tell me and I'll forget, teach me and I might remember, involve me and I'll learn. And it's very appropriate for the day, right? Okay, Dan. So Dan is our uh, newly appointed Dean of the Graduate School of Education. And Dan is actually an expert, one of the world experts in, in uh, learning through instruction. Now, we've been talking a little bit about higher education. This is a higher education context but you think a lot also about the pre-college 
stage. And I wonder if, if there are any things, uh, any thoughts that you have about whether the things, innovations that are happening in the world at high, in higher education are applicable or should be applied at the K-12 level? Uh, good question. Uh, so two, two, two types of answers to this. Uh, one is universities kind of have a special relationship to do research in K-12, to prepare students and to provide access. So, th so this, I think, is, a, you're going to hear a lot of talks about this, about ways that we're studying to help all people learn better. The second answer, which is more direct to your question, is uh, there are certain things from the higher education that we want to suffuse into K-12 and certain things probably not. So a uh, lecture hall filled with uh, 400 second graders listening to a chemistry lecture. Uh, it might work for about five minutes, uh, pro probably not eight hours, yeah. Uh, so one, one thing that really has suffused and it's very characteristic of college is something called discipline-based education. And the idea is that in different disciplines, you have fundamentally different methods for growing knowledge. You know, in science, you rely on evidence. In mathematics, you make conjectures about generality. So this is uh, finally starting to show up in K-12. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Sam Weinberg, made a curriculum called Thinking Like a Historian. And this is taking off like wildfire in districts uh, across the nation. Or uh, Joe Bowler, who's a professor of mathematics education, has created an edX professional develop development website called YouCube that, that has you know, hundreds and thousands of teachers trying to learn how to teach math, honoring math. So, so the days of kind of one pedagogy fits all content uh, are gone. And so I think that's a very good effect. So things like Sam's innovations in history and instruction and, and, and Joe's in mathematics, how, how do we get those out into the world? How does, you're now dean of the School of Education, how can you spread those ideas and innovations out in the world? Uh, financial support from Stanford gets us started. <laughs> Uh, so this, this is a very good question, right? That, that these things do require some monetary basis to keep going, and so this is a, a big question of how you can bring it out. Okay, I, you know, I wanna ask uh, an easy question that I'm gonna ask all of you to, to say something about um, in, in a few words, and that is, what is education going to look like in 25 years? <laughs> John, do you wanna start? What is education going to look like in 25 years? Well, first of all, I think that's not going to be something we're going to be able to answer right today, uh, although I'll try to take a, a crack at it. So one thing that I think is important for us here on campus and for other institutions elsewhere is to keep asking ourselves that question. Uh, we have 2,000 uh, creative, clever, insightful faculty, and we'll have to discuss that uh, for some period of time. I think we are seeing some good ideas about uh, how to engage students in learning that are different from presenting information. So I think we'll become more sophisticated here on campus and in many ways how, uh, as teachers and in facilitating learning. Uh, the way that that gets expressed and developed into our programs uh, will evolve over time. Uh, in addition to discussing what we're doing in the future, I think we will continue iteratively to try to apply many different ideas here on campus. And I think for us here, and, and probably for many other institutions, uh, we're going to think a little bit more about how to work with people and help them uh, over their lives. And that will also make the entire experience for people who are here at a particular point in their life uh, richer. So I see both an expansion in terms of the audience that we reach, for any given age, but also over the lifespan, I think we will try to engage people in learning more effectively. Right, and I think we'll hear more about that later on in, in the afternoon. So Carolyn, as a historian, 25 years is a, a drop in the bucket, right? Drop and so in the bucket. you're gonna tell us exactly what it's gonna look like <laughs> in 25 years. Yeah, well, yes, as John is saying, universities are hundreds of years old, and, and that's the good news that they've, performed a useful social function for so, so much time, and, and we are looking forward to universities continuing to do so. Um, I know, of course, as a historian that we're good at, at analyzing the past. We're not as good at predicting the future, but I do know that we can say two things about the future. 
One is that there's going to be more of us. Uh, there's going to be more of us in the United States. There's going to be more of us in the world. The number of young people is going to continue to swell. And therefore, the, the, the importance of universities is only going to be magnified. Same thing with K through 12 education. The other thing that we know is that people are going to live longer. And what that means is that the function of the university must also continue to expand. And I know we're going to be hearing more about this this afternoon. But we must all become lifelong learners. We are training for the jobs that we think are going to be there. But we must also look ahead to the lives that we are somewhat less certain about, but that we know we are going to live. And it is up to K through 12 and the universities to think very deeply, not just about uh, training for jobs, but also about the full lives um, and becoming full human beings. OK, Dan, as dean of the School of Education, how, how, how is education going to be in 25 years? Uh, so I'm, I'm not a huge supervision guy, but uh, here, here are two things that I think are very likely. Uh, one is we're going to figure out how to teach really hard concepts like quantum physics. I think we're going to figure out how to do this. The second is that I think you'll see a tenfold increase in opportunities to learn outside of school. So I, I, don't, I, I don't quite know how to do the computation, but I suspect YouTube is a lot bigger than Sesame Street already. And so the, there's going to be lots of interesting developments in that area. Mm -hmm. So, OK, so, so you've, talked a, you've all talked a little bit about what you currently see, and you've talked about where you think maybe we will go. Um, if it, you're all educators. How are you going to help get us there to that point? Now, uh, this is your role. <laughs> you're an administrator. <laughs> how am I help us get, get there? I think we. Uh, we have programs here on campus to help uh, different faculty try their own ideas. I think it's very difficult to think of a one-size-fits-all solution for this. We have many people with different ideas, so we are helping uh, different faculty experiment with different formats in their courses, uh, different kinds of, of learning environments. Uh, residential learning is important. Uh, so we have different kinds of classrooms and facilities in the residences and different programs there. Uh, I think it's important to, to encourage people to use their creativity, think about what they'd like their students to learn, and then dream up different ways to engage them in order to learn that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Caroline. Well, I think that the thing we can be doing now is exactly what we're doing today, is to continue to break down the barriers between what happens in universities and what happens in K through 12 education. There's a tendency for those two um, parts of our important educational system to run somewhat separately. And I know that, that some of our faculty help to bridge those um, those gaps, but I think that this can happen a lot more. We have so much to offer one, one another and so much to learn from one another. I know that this is true in the case with humanities education as well. I learned so much from high school teachers and what they um, bring to the teaching of the humanities to their students. Uh, so this is just a, a perfect kind of venue for these kinds of explorations. Mm -hmm. Dan? So it is a slightly unfair question. It is. I've, I've been dean for a month. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> so uh, two things I think stand out. One is the question you asked, which is how do, how do we uh, translate and partnership the research and get it out there so that it's usable and, and sort of not burdensome to take it up? The second within Stanford is it's sort of a two-way street. So as college classes move towards active learning. Uh, this is where you don't just sit and listen to a lecture. Uh, the K-12 space has actually worked out lots of things, say collaborative learning. It's very good. And so bringing some of that wisdom to higher education, I think, could be very effective in the short run. OK. Would you all join me in thanking our panelists for, for their thoughts? For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.